So, guys, welcome to the next episode of uh, Deep Talks podcast. And my today's guest is Jeremy Howard. Hi, Jeremy. Hello, hello. Greetings from Prague to Texas. Thank you. <laughs> and Jeremy is a data scientist. He was teaching for Singularity University. His uh, TED Talk has done um, more than two and a half million views. And he's a founding researcher at uh, Fast AI. And uh, he's originally from Australia. But the most important part and uh, the way how we um, have met was that uh, we are both uh, working on the same project that is called Masks for All. So, and that is why this is a different episode, because I'm interviewing you as well as you're interviewing <laughs> me. So I, there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we had a first call, and I guess it was March 26th. And it was before we published the international video uh, about Masks for All movement. And it was two days before Jeremy wrote an article for the Washington Post. And his article was uh, the first one one of the first ones that uh, started um, an avalanche. There are more and more uh, so articles and so Jeremy was... I mean, it was the first... It yeah. was the first in the English speaking press to make a, like right. in the mainstream right. English speaking press, press to make a clear like call for masks. Um, Zainab Tufekci had already written an article about how misguided the... Um, Uh, masks don't work messaging was when it was really just to protect PPE, but it was still a long time, uh, weeks after all the yeah. stuff that you had done uh, in Czech Republic. And now we have some good news. More than 65 countries, they, in some form, they have uh, masks mandatory and CDC in the US changed its uh, approach on masks and uh, the reach of the movement Masks for All is uh, greater than 1.1 billion. Uh, so, yeah, so we have eight so of the nice. top. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> no, thank you. We have eight of the top 10 cities in the US require masks and mask requirements or recommendations now cover 88% of the world population. Wow. That's incredible. So thank you so much. And uh, I know that you uh, co-authored in a scientific paper that is in a state of preprint, right? Right, yeah, so, still waiting for a review on that one. Yeah, Maybe uh, for the beginning, uh, if you can like uh, summarize the main findings of, of that, that uh, preprint uh, study. Yeah, I mean, so um, I, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just a data scientist. And um, although like you, I'm kind of known as a science communicator, uh, our deep learning MOOC, I think, might be the most popular in the world. Um, and so I, you know, we've had th something like 20 million minutes of watch time on these mm -hmm. deep learning videos. Uh, so I'm kind of, I'm used to talking about technical material in a fairly, you know, accessible way like you do. Um, but I don't know anything about masks or anything. <laughs> so I, I basically put together a team of 19 people to try to answer the question, is public mask wearing actually a good idea? Because I was getting a lot of pushback from policy folks saying, mm -hmm. our science advisors say it's not clear. So yeah, basically, uh, we didn't do any of our own um, science per se, we just read papers. And it, so it was a literature review, we just said, here's what so the existing papers say. Kind of systemic review or like similar like meta analysis or Yeah, I would call it a meta-analysis because that's normally where you combine randomized controlled trials statistically. But this was a literature review where we looked at different all kinds of evidence, lab, lab evidence, physics evidence, epidemiological evidence, and so forth. So there was a sociologist on the team. There was an epidemiologist on the team, a biostatistician on the team, a forecaster on the team, so forth. And uh, yeah, it basically um, seemed pretty clear that... Um, wearing a mask to stop potentially infected droplets from coming out mm -hmm. uh, works super, super well, and that doing that can dramatically reduce community transmission, and that um, uh, it's all about having... <clears throat> uh, and, and, and also that it doesn't seem to matter too much what kind of mask 
you use. Mm -hmm. uh, the important thing is that nearly everybody covers their f mouth with something. Um, and since that time, I've looked at more research around this question of like, if you do it wrong, could you end up making things worse by touching your face or disposing of it wrongly or something? And the answer there seems to be probably not. Like, it seems like transmission through surfaces and particularly through cloth is like rare or non-existent. So I think this is why we see in countries like the Czech Republic, which, you know, have gone with masks from pretty early on, have seen such great results. Right. So still the main uh, way of the transmission is through droplets, right? Right. And uh, whatever in front of your face uh, can stop the transmission. So even right. though the mask is uh, like from your old teacher, it still can stop uh, those droplets. And th this idea yeah. is to me very simple. And uh, I'm, I still don't know why uh, WHO didn't recommend this simple uh, right. to <clears throat> five, six weeks ago. Right. So, what, what, what yeah, so I mean, this what, is um, best explained to me by uh, Professor uh, Vladimir Zimmel, who you, of yeah. course, put me in touch with uh, from the Czech Academy of Sciences. And the way he describes it is that some kind of face covering creates like a that mini atmosphere in front of your face, a very humid atmosphere. And so that humid atmosphere causes the droplets to not evaporate. And that's what you want, right? Because if they evaporate, then they become so small that a cloth filter can't stop them. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this little mini atmosphere you have in front of the face as you breathe out or as you talk or sing or whatever, these mm -hmm. big droplets, big, much bigger droplets easily get caught in the cloth and it doesn't matter too much what you use. Right. And you had an amazing interview for uh, BBC, but uh, in, in, in the UK, they still don't uh, have mandatory masks. Uh, what, what do you think, what, what are the main challenges uh, that our movement has in, in this time? Yeah, so there's a few. Um, so one of the folks I've been had the pleasure of working with a lot on this is uh, Professor Tricia Greenholz, who uh, is an Oxford University professor, and she works with the uh, Oxford COVID-19 Evidence Review Service. And she's actually written one of the world's uh, top books on evidence-based healthcare. Mm -hmm. And the way she kind of describes it is, evidence-based healthcare is this thing which is almost entirely based around the idea of a randomized controlled trial where you decide to do a healthcare intervention based on whether or not you can say, here's a group of people that were randomly selected and had an intervention and here's a group that weren't. Mm -hmm. And um, that works pretty well for drugs, but it works terribly for these uh, public health measures. And this is something that right. Trish has been helping me to understand because um, you can't if you want to test the impact of public mask wearing on community transmission, you would have to get a bunch of communities that never wear masks and a bunch of communities that always wear masks and that otherwise those two communities are as similar as possible. There's no way to, no way to do that ethically. So one of the challenges has been there's a lot of um, people who are only familiar with evidence in the form of a randomized controlled trial, and particularly a lot of people at WHO, particularly a lot of people who are like older who aren't necessarily familiar with more modern methods. So there's been this uh, scientific kind of smashing together of viewpoints between like the only randomized controlled trials work versus the like, let's oh, do things okay. which make a hell of a lot of sense. And we have lab studies for, and we have observational studies for, and where the benefits clearly outweigh the costs. And uh, that line of thinking is, pretty alien to a lot of the WHO folks. Um, and so that's why you've been now in this really weird situation where the vast majority of the world's um, centers for disease control, including Europe's and the US's and China's have now directly gone against the official WHO advice, which is a super weird situation. Right, yeah. Because we were in, in quite a hurry uh, and they were, in my point of view, they were very slow in changing their opinion and they still haven't the who yeah still haven't yeah i think that they they made some small small changes in their recommendation yeah. but only like in tiny details but and if you look at the kind of the kind of 
population epidemiological evidence now, it strongly suggests that the countries that are that are winning this fight against COVID-19 are the ones that have moved the fastest rather than the ones that have been the most precise. Um, and so moving, you know, moving fast means moving with imperfect or incomplete evidence. Right, because this was a new situation, so and it was very difficult to uh, wait for uh, evidence because then like you, you will uh, lose many lives if you wait three right weeks so peter let me know. turn the tables and ask you right because okay. um <laughs> i i had started um researching this masks question uh for, for my students i wanted to do a, a a lesson about kind of evidence and data and um kind of probabilistic decision making. And after I'd been kind of researching this for a while with no particular view of what I would expect to find, I came across your uh, YouTube video in Czech. <laughs> and then I came across this uh, Google doc describing the story from the Czech Republic. And I'd never heard it. I'd never seen it mentioned in the English speaking press. And um, at that point, I was kind of just planning to deliver this lesson as just like a interesting academic exercise because i thought um people in the west would never wear masks i just felt culturally that was unlikely to happen um and uh, then i discovered hey there's a role model here of actually a western country that has done it and then i thought okay well we should try to do it as well and we should try to do it exactly the way that the czech republic did it because this this is the only country in the world that's done it so, yeah, no, I, I wanted to hear about the bit of the history of this. Like, how did you, um, ha, you know, A, how did you kind of first decide this might be a good idea? And then B, how did you develop this incredibly successful public health campaign, for, you know, uh, off the back of a YouTube video? And, you know, things like my mask protects you, your mask protects me. You know, where did all that come from? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was a uh, funny story in the beginning because uh, I live partially in Manhattan and partially in Prague. Like last two two years, uh, I spent like 60% of my time in Manhattan, in New York. And uh, w when there was the outbreak in, in Italy, uh, I still was in Manhattan. And uh, I saw one shop that they offered uh, some masks there. And I was like, I was thinking, okay, maybe I can buy some masks. And I was quite unsure how it works. I just bought like 10 masks. And then I was thinking like, okay, what is the real science behind that? And as I do some uh, lectures on critical thinking, I'm used to like uh, quickly dig into the sci scientific papers. And uh, I'm used to read uh, abstracts and uh, connect dots, by, basically. So... And I was, I remember that uh, it was the day I, I visited a show uh, in Broadway and I was thinking like, this is one of the best uh, best weeks in my life. And then I got a, a text you know, from from my friend and she told me that uh, Donald Trump is going to cancel all, all flights from, from Europe. And I was thinking like, no, it could not happen. And in two hours, he really did. So... I bought a, a new ticket uh, for the next day, mm. and basically I went to JFK, and I was I was a little bit scared because no one knew if if they are going to cancel those flights or th there was a high level of uncertainty. And when I uh, boarded that plane, I was the only one with a face mask, and I was thinking like, okay, th there is the outbreak. And was that a N95 respirator style mask you were wearing at that point? Yeah, it, it was uh, an N95 ma mask. Mm. So that's why I started to uh, do the research on those masks. And then I... Uh, so you uh, wore it on the plane trip all the way back to right, Europe? Yeah, and mm -hmm. it was terrible, by the way. It was terrible. I spent like eight, eight maybe nine hours in uh, that, a face mask. And I was mm. unable to fall asleep because I was afraid. Like, mm. I, I didn't know if you could or couldn't sort of fall asleep in that. So uh, it was a very strong um, moment in my life because I was a little bit scared. I didn't know like, if I'm the crazy one or if the others are the crazy ones. So uh, that's why the day after my arrival to Prague... Just by the way, we had the same thing. You know, um, yeah. 
we wanted to get to Texas to be around my um, wife's family, particularly because they're all healthcare workers. And uh, we decided well before the San Francisco lockdown that we should do that. Um, but once we decided, we thought we should go the next day because like exponential increase means every day we wait is like a certain percentage higher chance. And uh, we, yeah, same with us. We wore masks. We had never worn a mask before. <laughs> you know, our four-year-old daughter was not too thrilled about it. And, um, you know, we spent the whole plane trip thinking like, oh, did you know, <laughs> did we just get ourselves infected on this metal tube? Right. And I remember that there was a moment uh, at the airport that I asked my followers on Instagram, like, and I, I, I asked them like, guys, what do you think? Should I wear a mask or not? Or am I crazy if I'm wearing a mask? And uh, 80% of uh, my followers, they, they told me that I, sh I definitely should wear a face mask. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend, and this is really funny because my friend, that uh, she's an actress and she lived in LA. She wrote me like long uh, a message that I really have to wear a face mask. And that's the lady. She, she's the main actor of uh, the video that we made Great. The, Great. one week later. So <laughs> it was very funny because she, she was following my old journey from from states to back to Europe and uh, she's my very good friend and that's why she's in the video because she was uh, from the beginning with me in, in this story. So, I see. So and when I arrived to Prague, uh, I realized that uh, there were two groups of people, like one already wearing some face covering and this was very small group, less than 1% of uh, inhabitants. And there were like... A bigger group of people that they were, they were laughing to those with masks. They were uh, thinking that it really uh, doesn't work. Th then uh, there were, were yeah. Were, this is why I thought this would be impossible, right? Because, um, like in Australia, where I'm originally from, mask wearing is associated with uh, Asian ethnicities. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of racism associated yeah. with it, and I thought like that was one of our big worries: is if we got on this plane wearing a mask, that we might. You know, people might get angry at us for exactly. some kind of xenophobic, yeah. And uh, there were some, for example, uh, companies, they, they forbid their employees to wear face masks, not to scare their, their uh, customers. So it was, yeah, right. it was in, in the beginning, it was even in my imagination, almost impossible to, to change that many minds. Mm -hmm. Flight, flight attendants were banned here from wearing them mm -hmm. until just in the last few days, the FAA now requires, uh, wow. uh, well, the FAA, certainly every major airline now requires mm -hmm. masks for both employees and passengers. And I think the FAA might be putting a rule in place at some point. Wow. It's very important too, yeah, because you don't want to spread the virus all mm -hmm. around. So, yeah. And uh, then I, I recorded the first video in Czech language, and I think that there are two main reasons wh why it worked. First was that it was grounded in science, so I made uh, the, the the analysis of uh, the scientific papers. And the second was that I asked some main influencers to share a picture of themselves in a face mask. And that was probably the turning point, because from top 20 accounts on Instagram, like 15 of them, they shared the picture of themselves in a mask in a few, few first. Uh, but let me just days. ask you, let me ask you more about that video, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the time I watched it, I thought, oh, this is a pretty good video. And more importantly, it worked. So in my first video, a lot of the time I said, here is a picture of Peter Ludwig and here is what he's <laughs> saying. And here's, you know, yeah. um, I was just like plagiarizing very directly. So it's like, you know, what he said worked. So let's do exactly the same thing. And, but in hindsight, um, I now understand why a lot of those messages were really important, right? And and I want to understand how the hell you managed to get it so right. Like this thing about um, my mask protects you, your mask protects me. A, this, the science is golden on that, right? And we know a lot more about that now than we used to. But like scientifically, it's, it's exactly how it happens. Uh, but B, this kind of altruistic message is like genius at, reversing the stigma so that then it creates a stigma around like not wearing a mask things like the dog poop example of like hey you don't think people will do this or <laughs> people can change their minds like there was a lot of um very you know very thoughtful kind of sociology going on here like it, it, is this just stuff you just 
came up with one night or where did these kind of ideas come from? Well, uh, basically, uh, I have a major in computer science and my uh, major and my final thesis was the multi-agent simulation. So something between uh, computer science and sociology. And I'm, my uh, main field of interest is uh, complex system science. So basically how to connect the dots and how to do those uh, tipping points and change the, the whole from those little uh, little details like uh, like the, the nudging uh, is my favorite strategy to change uh, the bigger um, systems. So so it was fairly intentional. These specific messages you were giving, right? Right. It was intentional, and uh, I'm working. I have my own company for 14 years now, and what we do, we do. Uh, like conferences about critical thinking, lectures about critical thinking. So uh, I think that uh, people here, they already uh, know that um, what we do is evidence-based. So I was always trying to push the idea of uh, evidence-based approach here in, in Czech Republic. So the first is evidence-based approach. And the second is uh, that I wrote a book that is called The End of Procrastination. And the, the main difference with between other books is that uh, it's full of simple pictures, simple diagrams. And mm. I use those diagrams in the video. So if you remember those right. uh, drawings, so, yeah. and my, my way uh, of explaining things is that uh, I really believe in simplicity. So right. uh, explaining- Which is really unusual for people who do science stuff. A lot of right. like science is grounded in the idea of making things complex because that's how you get published is by showing how clever you are. So in the combination between simplicity and the evidence-based approach, I think it somehow it works and it, it works in all, all, all domains. So it's, we can use this approach, not just in, in uh, sociology, but we can use it in medicine, in uh, computer science, because- And how did you, how did you get these influences on board? Were they some of them were people you know? Did you reach out to mutual acquaintances, or did they just spontaneously? Yeah, do that's it? the main difference between my life in Czech Republic and in the U.S. Because uh, in Czech Republic, the country is small; it has ten million people, right. and basically, you know mostly all those people in person. And if you don't mm. know them in person, you know someone who knows them. Yeah, so that's what I figured. The size of the country seems yeah, perfect for this. Uh, in the U.S., I have some contacts, but it's very difficult to reach out those influencers because they have millions of followers and there is a huge gap between you and them. But here right. in Czech Republic, you can meet the, 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 the most famous singers uh, for a dinner and it's, pos it's, it's possible. Mm -hmm. So we are visiting the same clubs and we have some common friends always. So... Uh, that, that was much easier here. That's why it yeah. worked in three days. Also, one of the challenges in the U.S. is it's like there's all these little sub-communities, right. you know, like there's the San Francisco bit and the New York mm. bit and the rural Montana <laughs> bit. And, you know, it's uh, it, I don't think there's many examples historically of kind of like nationwide U.S. grassroots community right. movements. And let, let me ask you something. Uh, how is the, the politics of masks? Because uh, I remember that there was a moment that uh, Ivanka Trump shared uh, the picture that she, she's uh, uh, producing a face mask. And then um, I think few few uh, candidates uh, from uh, Democratic Party shared a uh, mask for of movement. And then I re recognized that there is some kind of clash between uh, governors and the central uh, U US government about masks and about rules. So uh, how, how, how it works now? Like, uh, are, yeah. are masks kind of a po political issue or? Kind of. So, um, so that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things I've been working really hard on for the last month or two mm -hmm. is, um, you know, after I did the Washington Post article, which was requested by uh, an editor there after they saw my video. Um, so that was just good luck. And then after the Washington Post thing came out, because it was kind of like 
this was new, therefore it's news. And therefore I was, you know, asked to go on Good Morning America and Nightline and Joy Reid and, you know, all these big national cable shows. Um, and um, one of the things that, that, that happened was I um, was fortunate enough to get in touch with a, a U.S. senator uh, called Pat Toomey, who was uh, really interested in this topic. And I chatted to him and he, and he was kind of like, so is this, is this real? Is this, is this a good idea? Is this a thing? And I was like, yeah, I mean, this is, could be really, really important. And like, I think the next day or two days later, he did a video, you know, which he put on Twitter. And suddenly we had a, a US senator. And at the same time that was happening, I was thinking, okay, there's always a danger that if a US, this is a Republican senator comes out and says, this is a good idea, all the Democrats are going to assume it's not. <laughs> so um, uh, so I uh, got some help reaching out to a uh, Democratic senator and um, uh, had a similar conversation, Senator called Michael Bennett, also, you know, was great. Mm -hmm. the day after that, he put a picture up on Twitter of him and his wife wearing masks and then they did a joint press release and so suddenly we, we now have a bipartisan mm -hmm. thing and so that was important um and then uh they helped me uh well i shouldn't they say that i should say they then organized uh, a briefing of 10 senate officers for me so then i found myself briefing again a, a bipartisan wow. large mm -hmm. group yeah no and that was great um and, you know, from that, I uh, helped kind of, you know, pre-brief the folks who ended up talking to Donald Trump, who ended up talking to the senior people at CDC. Um, and then, I, you know, that led to Donald Trump being asked at a press conference, would you wear a mask? And by that point, he had been briefed. And so he was like, you know, probably a good idea. I'd, you know, I might wear a scarf, for example, which is a perfectly reasonable response, as you know. Um so the you know the that that little kind of those connections uh, really made this huge difference, um, but that was also why we did a scientific study because I started uh, talking to a lot of the um, scientific advisors who were you know um, briefing folks like the CDC, um, and that was when I started getting hearing back saying like okay well you know, we keep hearing that people aren't convinced by the science. And so that's why I put together this, you know, cross-disciplinary team, mm -hmm. super great people. Because I, I didn't have a good answer. <laughs> you know, I was like, well, it makes sense that like if you put something in front of some, you know, in front of some liquid, then it'll stop it. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we really needed to, to actually show, we needed to also show like kind of sociology impacts like in America, Mask wearing is kind of pretty stigmatized to people of color, as I'm sure you know, particularly young black men. Um, uh, and we're also working with folks in Africa where mask wearing is associated with tuberculosis, which is a very highly stigmatized disease. Um, so uh, Zainet Chufekci was kind enough to bring her sociology expertise because that's she's a professor of that area. Um, and uh, folks from the top kind of uh, tuberculosis um, uh public health advocacy groups also were involved. Um, so we kind of tried to hit on all of the key relevant areas. And uh, so it was nice then to be able to kind of then say to these scientific advisors, okay, you know, here's somewhere that you can look at the papers that we've looked at. And I actually used uh, Twitter and the fast AI community a lot there to basically, I just said like to my community, like, Hey, can't find every paper you can good, bad, or indifferent uh, that might in any way touch on the question of whether public mask wearing helps or doesn't help. And so thanks to that, we ended up with 84 references. Um, and so, you know, reading them all was, the boringest thing I think I've ever done. <laughs> um, and I, I get the impression almost nobody else has read all the papers. I keep on having discussions with people who are meant to be experts in this area and they've just never actually read the papers. Um, but it, it, it did to help because the, the politicians rely a lot on their scientific advisors. So you kind of have to convince them as well 
Today it's somewhat partisan, but not too partisan. There's, uh, I think, three Republican states and nine Democrat states that require masks. Um, one of the, the first Republican governor um, was uh, a guy called Larry Hogan. And uh, he was great. Like the way he messaged it, messaged it was so good. It's like, look, you know, people have rights. And one of my rights is to be able to go outside without getting sick. And so you don't have the right to spew your germs at me, you know, when you can easily avoid it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and, and putting it as a rights issue is, is a great messaging in a, in a Republican state, which is, which he leads. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been cool to see how, you know, some of the, some of these politicians have been very thoughtful about this and those that haven't have really pay the price right like uh governor dewine had to actually reverse his decision to require masks because like he just didn't seem to get the messaging out there well um Stillwater had to reverse their decision there was like people were promoting violence to not wear masks um so it's a politically challenging exercise here but i think it can you know i think uh larry hogan's shown that it it, it can be done so it doesn't, you know, it's not just a Democrat thing. Right. So, and um, in the U.S., uh, like, I saw that there is decline of new cases. So it seems that uh, the lockdown worked. But now uh, I guess that the future is to end the lockdown. And then uh, you probably need masks, right? To end uh, right. the lockdown quicker. Well, here's the problem. Um, we're coming into summer mm -hmm. and it really seems like transmission rates are lower when you have higher humidity and higher temperature, but nobody's talking about that. So I think with the lockdowns starting to get reduced at the same time summer is coming along, mm -hmm. my guess is that the, um, the growth will not be as high as people are expecting because of seasonality. And I think that's going to lead to people, you know, the public saying that, hey, you guys have freaked out over nothing, which means we may see masks not happen mm -hmm. until it's too late. Because then, of course, when winter comes, um, it's going to be worse, much worse than this time around, um, because we haven't had a whole winter of it in the US or Europe yet. Right. So I'm pretty worried, even with, you know, the states that are doing masks, I'm worried that they won't stick with them until, I'd be surprised if they stuck with them until winter. Yeah. And so my guess is that what's going to happen is that, you know, hubris will win mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, we won't be prepared for winter and things could get really bad. Right. Yeah, it's, it's quite a similar uh, discussion here because we already have masks for six weeks now. And of course, people, they don't like them, obviously, because <laughs> it's not the most pleasant thing that you can do. So the discussion now is like uh, if we should uh, change the rule to have mandatory masks just uh, for inside, because now you have to have uh, masks uh, everywhere. Uh, the only thing that you don't have to have a mask is during uh, sports, during exercise. You don't need. I mean, there's something to be said for that. Like... Um... You know, if we cause too much inconvenience and discomfort and it's really not needed, that mm -hmm. that can lead to lack of compliance. And it does seem like, you know, transmission rates indoors are like 20 times higher or 20 times more likely than, than outdoors. Now, of course, there are, and I mean, places like New York, you're kind of, or Hong Kong, you're face to face right. with people. So that's a bit different. Mm -hmm. But many parts of the US and I'm sure many parts of the Czech Republic, um, wearing a mask outside seems like overkill to me, you know, when you can easily stay six feet away and there's moving air and you're moving and, you know, so I, you know, I yeah, can certainly now, see why. We are now thinking about a, a new recommendation for the government because I'm still a member of the group uh, COVID Czechia that uh, is consists of those scientists from the video. So that there is a, a president of, the Czech Technical University, there is Mr. Stimal that is from the Czech uh, Academy of Sciences. Mm. And so we are thinking to uh, make a new recommendation for the government uh, about masks. So, and 
this is gonna be probably in the upcoming week. But I'm still how, unsure what is the best solution because yeah. we still don't have. How is tech? How is done. how is um how is test and trace going in Czechia? Do do you have a kind of tracing app that lots of people are using? And you know, yeah, if, well, like in other words, if, if things get bad in winter, are you likely to be able to track it and and trace where it's come from and get a yeah. lockdown in a smaller area? Yeah, there was an uh, app that is called like uh, eMask. And it's uh, made of, um, of the gr group of uh, scientists and data scientists, and but only a few percent of people they use this app. So we need to, yeah, so I don't know, to push the similar thing in Australia, I think. Yeah. See, see, the Southern Hemisphere is unfortunately for them, they're the ones who are actually kind of going to be the guinea pigs for this seasonality issue, because like in Australia, there's a lot of hubris already. There's a lot of people saying, "Oh, we've beaten this." Right. And so now Australia and New Zealand are talking about opening the border between those countries. Um, and of course, they, winter's coming for them. <laughs> so, I mean, their bad news is our good news, I guess, if, you know, we'll maybe be able to see what, what winter looks like compared to summer when things flip over in the Southern Hemisphere. But I, I do worry about, you know, my hometown of Melbourne, Australia, that mm. could be a tough winter there. Right. And we have uh, many volunteers from New Zealand too. I'm a member of a Facebook group, Mets for All New Zealand. And uh, they, they made some uh, meme uh, pictures of uh, from Game of Thrones, like winter is coming and with a face mask. And <laughs> that's quite funny. I re I re by the way, I really like how, how uh, people are creative in this, uh, how they are creative, not in ju just making their own mask, but uh, how they... Uh, spread the message because I saw so many right. funny pictures about uh, those ideas, but it, it's the best way how to well, check Well, Czechia has been a role model there. I mean, you know, you yeah. guys had a lot of cool memes and videos <laughs> and uh, doing fun things like putting masks on statues. And right, yeah. <laughs> from what I've read, that's that kind of uh, humor and, um, you know, zany side is, was an important part of the community response. Exactly, because there were some musicians that they made uh, like music videos about mm. face masks, and it was very helpful in the beginning. So basically, after three days, almost everyone wore a face mask, Amazing. and then the government followed. So it was not that government made mask mandatory. Well, exactly, yeah. The population already wear them. So and exactly, that, that, that's the way not to just push politicians, but uh, to explain as many people, and then those people. Bush politicians. Yeah, and I, I actually used one of those stories in my first Washington Post article. I, I really tried to talk to a lot of folks from Czechia, and uh, some folks were kind enough to explain to me about how they'd converted their bar, which they had to close because of distancing. They'd converted it into um, a mask factory by basically borrowing neighbors' sewing machines and uh they had like 10 people working full time creating like 400 masks a day um and so i was able to like include this story in the article and i think that really helped to kind of um anchor the narrative around a specific human story of like okay this is what grassroots community response looks like and we we're not seeing as much of it here in the u.s but we're certainly seeing some there are certainly folks who are doing a lot for their community for helping create masks for people who need them. Yeah, I think that it was uh, one of the uh, most important moments of, of the whole story because uh, many people, they started to do things for others. And the selfless motivation, we know, is much stronger than just selfish motivation. So uh, at the end, probably, uh, well, coronavirus did a lot of bad things, but uh, it also inspired many good things. And this community yeah. help was, was was incredible and for me it, it, it was uh, the moment when I realized that I'm proud of the country that, that uh, I'm from and yeah uh, I, I got a bit of that uh, amongst the kind of tech community in the San Francisco Bay Area as well I got to say like uh, there was um, there's a lot of people that have contributed so much to masks for all here and creating the website masksforall.co and Creating the, um, we created this uh, campaign where you send a text message uh, and it will send cause a letter to get sent to your government representative. Um, 
there's like just seeing how many people are just dedicating full-time work to, you know, we had folks, uh, PR folks volunteer to help with all this media coverage. Um, yeah. It's been cool. And they're, you know, these are all people I've never met in person, right. um, but I now feel like I've got this kind of big group of friends who are super inspiring experts across all these different areas, just volunteering their, their expertise and time to work on this public health issue. Right. Yeah, and I remember our first call that uh, uh, was before you published the first article, and uh, I remember that I told you that, hey, Jeremy, m maybe this is the most important project in our life, and still mm -hmm. I believe yeah. that it, it is because uh, mm -hmm. we had an outbreak of the coronavirus and we had a simple solution, and I was thinking like, oh, how is it possible to have a simple solution for such a huge problem right. of the, the right. whole world? Right. So, and I In fact, even before even before this masks thing, um, my my wife Rachel and I wrote an article in the Fast AI blog, just saying like, mm -hmm. "Hey, as data scientists, here's our view of like COVID nineteen." As basically like, it actually looks like it might get quite bad, <laughs> you know, and um, maybe you should actually stop large events right now maybe you should you know and uh it it that was at that point by far the most widely read thing we'd ever written it had like seven hundred thousand people wow. read it in our little fast ai blog uh -huh. and we kind of thought oh wow okay this is like at that point like okay this is the most important article we've ever written because we kept on hearing people from hearing people saying like oh i run a hospital and as a result of that article we got together with our executive team and decided to change, you know, how many people can be in the waiting room at once, or we decided to cancel this conference or whatever. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's interesting how like, yeah, you can, um, you can write some words or you can record a video and you can like influence huge groups of people, the vast majority of who you'll actually never even hear about. Yeah. And I think that the, the most important part of all of this is a, to have really good intention, like to really help others. Yeah, mm. Because um, I, I'm, I'm preparing a new book about uh, purpose at work. And cool. so I, I, I made a like analysis of all the research about purpose and about intrinsic motivation and how a purpose is the key uh, driver or uh, like right. the, 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 the uh, core of intrinsic motivation is, is purpose. And right, exactly. uh, the core of purpose is to really do things that are greater than you that can uh, influence communities that you are part of and so on so and I really believe that this was the moment and uh, everything was connected in, in that moment that I think wow this is the moment when we yeah no absolutely and absolutely yeah I mean this is something we talk about a lot in fast AI as well so actually I don't know if you know this but fast AI itself actually has no revenue, no donations, no grants. It's entirely self-funded. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no advertisements. Um, it's everything we do is for the reason you mentioned. It's, you know, because it's a purpose we care about, which in that case is making AI more accessible so that it's not this kind of exclusive thing and so that it solves real world problems. Um, and, you know, one of the nice things about that is we kind of, now have this huge community of people who are attracted by by not just the particular purpose we have, but just by the idea that purpose is important. And so I keep hearing from our students these stories about how like they quit their job doing hedge fund trading and decided to start studying medicine or earthquake resilience mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. Um, it, it's, you know, and, and we always, uh, big part of our courses is always uh, about ethics and actually my my wife Rachel the co-founder of fast AI um, she's a math PhD she was an early uber data scientist um, you know highly technical actually recently uh, founded uh, uh, is the or one of the founders is she's the um, founding director of the Council for Applied Data Ethics mm -hmm. at the University of San Francisco and um, you know, we kind of tell data scientists 
don't just do the analysis, but get behind what it says, you know, make sure that you're doing something for a reason that you follow it all the way through. So it's kind of been nice to be able to like, talk to our students through this and say like, okay, you know, here we are doing it here is trying to turn this scientific analysis into something that actually makes, makes a difference. Right. So let's discuss uh, some other big issues and big challenges that we as a, a global community have. Um, and uh, I have two, two uh, topics that I want to discuss with you. First is uh, fake news and uh, especially like uh, deep fake uh, videos and AI f- or used for uh, generating uh, fa- fake news. So what is your point on that? And uh, what do you think that the future will look like? So I have a specific sp- perspective on this, um, which is I'm extremely worried about uh, AI used for generating um, disinformation and misinformation, but I'm actually not nearly as worried about deep fakes or fake news as I am about fake discourse. So um, what I mean by that is this. So I don't know if you know this, but I'm uh, actually the co-author of a paper that developed something called ULM Fit, which was just about kind of the, the it was kind of in a lot of ways uh, spurred on or was a foundation of the kind of modern NLP uh, natural language processing movement of using like big pre-trained models that can do surprisingly powerful things. Um, my my co-author of that paper, Sebastian Ruder, called it um, NLP's ImageNet moment, which is referring to basically something similar that happened in the computer vision world that kind of, you know, made computer vision take off. And so this is like my key area of academic expertise. <laughs> it's definitely not masks. <laughs> um, and... Um, We are at a point now where we can create um, highly believable, compelling, context-appropriate text. It may not be right, but it feels right, and it's right. it's a suitable response to whatever it's replying to. So um, if you think about it, the vast majority of text which is created in the world is more like tweets and Facebook replies and stuff like that. It's not Washington Post articles. You know, if you want to create a fake Washington Post article, just Mm. write it, right? But the way we actually see um, influence happen is really in the social media world. And we're actually at a point now where a bad actor could reasonably easily, you know, get to a point where 99% plus of the replies and discussions you read on every social media channel are automatically created. And um, they won't be like some of them will look a bit weird, you know, but the vast majority, like, in fact, um, mm-hmm. there was a recent study that showed that uh, the most mm-hmm. recent generations of these approaches uh, are considered by humans to be more compelling than real human generated, um, uh, you know, social media responses. Mm-hmm. So in that situation, um, you know, uh, you can write a bot that specifically has the goal of um, maximizing disharmony because this is actually what most misinformation and disinformation campaigns do is it's not so much about pushing a particular Democrat or Republican message, but actually making people feel like um, it's hopeless to, to think for themselves. They can never know the truth that um, there's no point even trying, you know, it's to create so much disharmony and confusion that people um, feel incapable of coming to an assessment. And so we, you know, that's my worry is that, you know, if I was a, you know, a a, a bad actor wanting to do a really good disinformation campaign, I would just flood everything with it, you know, and um, nobody would know. Right. Um, And nobody would know if they were in a filter bubble of bots And really, everybody could be talking to nearly all bots nearly all the time, and we hmm. we might never find out. Right. Yeah, I, I have the same worry. So uh, because we we do a, a conference about critical thinking for se- six seven years, and uh, what I think is that it's getting worse, and the worries are getting worse every year because uh, we we have top scientists, uh, and I remember like three years ago we had a 
uh, AI scientist there and she, she had a, a talk about uh, emotions and how AI is uh, capable of recognizing uh, emotions. And, and I was thinking in that moment, oh, this is very useful for uh, generating um, like discussions. No, out you can actually people. optimize an emotional response. Right. Yeah. And so you can say like, uh, <clears throat> reply to this tweet uh, in the negative in exactly. a way that is as aggressive yeah. as possible or in so a way it, which is as, as empathetic as possible or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So and then if you just want to polarize people and divide them, you can uh, really be the, the biggest as well in the discussion. Uh, and you can have the algorithm that is uh, just uh, like making people the most in the most angry way. And, right. and also people um, like to fit in. Mm. And, you know, our brains are very good at um, making us think that we have logically come up with an idea when actually we're just following along with what everybody else is saying. So if you're like, if there's 15 other people, apparently people in a conversation all agreeing with each other about something and saying like, oh, people who don't agree with this are, are awful, it's very hard to have your brain disagree with that <laughs> and... Yeah. You know, it's and it'd be it'd be exhausting and stressful, and you know. And uh, I I know the uh, presidential candidate from Czech Republic that uh, th there are two candidates in the last election, and I know one of them in person, and that was the one who lost, and the difference was two percent, and we now know that the there was a huge influence of uh, fake news and those chain emails that uh, mostly all people sending themselves. And uh, still, that guy, uh, Mr. Drahos, told me that still in this moment, uh, many people uh, on the street, they, they are asking him those uh, rumors or uh, th those f fake news, if, if, if it's true. And it's not. And for him, it's very difficult to like, really explain to people that he's not Illuminati or... Right. Uh, and this is, this is without... And this is, you know, the, the, the previous generation was without any of these um, new algorithms. Because the algorithms I'm talking about that are so good at generation have only started to be developed in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, so nobody's seen what they can do yet. So and, um, can we use AI fighting against um no you can't and the reason for that is um uh, very simple if uh so recognizing real from fake or mm. bot from whatever um that's called uh, that's a type of thing called classification mm. uh, as opposed to generation which is generating some text so if you say like hey jeremy i've got a fantastic classification algorithm and i can and i can give it away that anybody can now use it to recognize whether your um tweets are auto generated or real then i'll be like oh thanks peter i'll take that and then i put that into my training pipeline and okay. i just continue to train until i am fooling your classifier so a, a classifier is only useful as long as you keep it secret and don't make it available to anybody in which case it's useless. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you make a classifier available, I can incorporate that into my training loop and train to train something which is specifically designed to trick it. Mm -hmm. So generation always has the upper hand nowadays. And how about to use uh, AI for fact checking? Uh, it's it's almost certainly impossible. Um, it also probably doesn't matter um, because when you actually look at the studies of um, what happens when you tell some somebody something's not true um, it actually doesn't really change their reaction right. so um, mm -hmm. so if you had a, a fact-checking algorithm that was trying to decide like oh Peter's come out on a YouTube video and said everybody should wear masks almost any algorithm would say um, Peter's wrong you know, because uh, actually, you you know, it would look at like the WHO and the European CDC and be like, oh, this is actually, you know, not in line with recognized health authorities. Um, and in fact, even like Snopes, which is a, a mm -hmm. non-automated fact checking now still has something basically saying, you know, yeah. about some masks meme. Oh, yeah. you know, actually masks, you know, don't work very well. So yeah. <laughs> fact checking is hard. <laughs> And unfortunately, <laughs> pointless. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, 
the best way how to change someone's uh, mind is uh, working with his emotions, right? Yes, emotions. So we're working on a campaign at the moment, at the moment to create the most emotional mask wearing campaign we okay. can, which, which luckily mm -hmm. is not too hard because, you know, as you, you know, you developed again, the, the whole foundation for this, this thing of like my mask protects you okay. wearing a mask is an expression of love, you know, for, your family, for your community, for your teammates, for your co-workers, mm -hmm. whatever. So when, you know, so we want to start asking people, who are you wearing your mask for? Wow. Um, wow. This and be really strong. And we want people writing it uh -huh. on their mask, you know, or creating masks with it on. Um, so, you know, yeah, look out for that, hopefully in the coming weeks. Because, um, you know, what we've done so far um, as you know, Peter is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we've we've got this campaign started, and it's uh, really likely to fizzle away. As happened in 1918 in San Francisco, the Anti Mask League appeared oh. in 1919 and had big open air, you know, um, protests, mm -hmm. and people stopped wearing masks, and then a lot of people died. Um, so we actually need this emotional sense of mm -hmm. like, I want to wear my mask because I, I want to, um, cause I do care and yeah, I want to show that I care. I, I want people to know that I care. It's a symbol of compassion. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, st still, we know that this is not a, a short run. It's, it's more like marathon. So yes. we are ready with Anita to do more videos and to really, uh, continue with this because as you said, like maybe, uh, the second wave will be much worse, or right. maybe. And will the other thing is, it it's highly it's highly local. Like, it kind of drives me crazy, right? My life for the last few weeks has been going from market to market, right? So it's like, okay, first of all, let's do US CDC, and then I worked hard mm -hmm. um, with some fantastic colleagues on trying to get air travel uh, and uh, other transit and retailers. So we've been working with a lot of unions for example, mm -hmm. who, who can put some pressure on companies and on, you know, um, elected representatives. And then, you know, the last couple of weeks I've been heavily on the UK because they are just <laughs> insane, you know. And now I'm starting, you know, so now Boris Johnson's finally come out and said, uh, yeah, we're going to need to wear masks. So now I'm starting to move uh, my attention to the Southern Hemisphere and to New Zealand and Australia where it's going to be a super, you know, but like each jurisdiction mm. it's you start from scratch you know because they right. think they're they think they're different you know so they have their own scientific advisors doing their own policy papers and they always make the same bloody mistakes yeah. every time mm -hmm. um so it's not just a marathon but it's like i don't know it's hundreds of marathons <laughs> right but but still like it's very positive that we that we already have some success and I think that uh, I, 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 really, I was really crying when New York made masks mandatory because for mm. me it was very emotional because when Gosh. I was leave, leave in New York like one one month ago, no one uh, has a face mask there. So Yeah, uh, no, that, absolutely. That for me, one of the strongest moments in my life really when, when I read the article that uh, New York is going for. No, it's great. Months. And I mean, I've been talking to union officials, for example, who have been just about in tears describing how their colleagues who drive buses are like dying all around them. And, and I'm saying like, let me tell you why. So it turns out like the airflow in US buses is back to front, goes from the back to the front. So it's literally, you know, the droplet nuclei are being blown into the working space of, of, of bus drivers. And yeah, man, it's heartbreaking to um, see see this so close. Um, but also, yeah, it's great when you hear like mm. you know steps that happen. Like finally, we have all the airlines on board now. It's like oof, you know, thank God. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of great volunteers in every jurisdiction. You know, um, there's. You mentioned New Zealand's got its own group and Australia's got its own group and the UK has got its own group. And, um, uh, you know, we're all trying to create the best materials we can to help right. those groups uh, do their thing. So yeah, I, I really think that oh, 
our your video and my video in the beginning where the small rocks into a huge avalanche and now something I like think that there's like more than maybe thousand five thousand people that is uh working for for the idea of the movement masks for and a lot of those people are amazing people you know like when i get in touch with these kind of random people around the world I, it often turns out they're yeah. extremely highly respected scientists or politicians or you know yeah. These these movements are full of passionate and brilliant people. And what was uh, the most strongest or one of the most strongest moment for, moments for you in the, the whole history? Um, well, I mean, one of them was just at, right at the start when uh, I put this video on YouTube and... At the time, I think I even said to my students, okay, I'm going to do the same thing that this Peter guy did and put this video on YouTube and <laughs> probably nothing will happen, but we'll give it a go. And then, um, you know, when two days later, this guy from the Washington Post said, can you write an article about this? I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I well, can't believe for, that YouTube video for, did something. It's not that you, you, usual that you are writing articles for uh, the Washington Post, right? No, I've never done that in my life. Hey. Yeah. Wow, that, that's a new, this, this is a new information for me because I thought that you are like their correspondent or something. That no, no, no. I'm just every, some every random wow. data scientist. <laughs> I'm like, I'm pretty well known in my little deep learning community. So if I go to an AI conference, people will know who I am. But if I go anywhere else, they 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 don't. Uh, and like, uh, so when that happened, I was like, how the hell do you write an op-ed for the Washington Post? So I... Um, <laughs> Luckily, I knew some friends who had written op-eds uh, for big newspapers, and they were so kind to take my draft and hmm. make it a million times but better. The article is brilliant. Like, I really believe that this was the turning point for the media in the U.S. I think so. it's brilliant too, but actually all the brilliant bits were not written by me, so I kind of feel bad it's only got my name on it. Uh, <laughs> You, you know, Jeremy, what, what is really funny that I remember that I saw your uh, TED talk like five years oh, ago. Wow. Because great. today I, I went through the video and I was, ah, I saw that. But uh, so I checked my notes. And that I was really in Brussels, you know. In, in 2015, I saw your talk. <laughs> yeah. So that was actually that was so funny. I did that because I had um, just started this new company called Enletic, which was the first company to focus on deep learning and medicine. Mm -hmm. And, but, um, a friend had asked me who runs the uh, TEDx Brussels, which I think is the largest TEDx in Europe. And like every year she would say, you should come to Brussels, you should come to Brussels. And at that time I was still working on Kaggle, which is this uh, big uh, deep uh, machine learning community competition website thing. And so I was always like, I can't do that. I'm, you know, I'm too busy. So then after I left Kaggle and before I started in Lytic, you know, she reached out again. She's like, come on, come to Brussels. And I was like, oh, fine. I don't have anything else on. Then, of course, by the time TEDx Brussels came along, I had started in Lydic. I absolutely didn't have time. And I was furious with myself for agreeing to do this TEDx event on the other side of the world. And uh, I can't believe how well it turned out. because I, I, So I, I basically didn't prepare. Um, so I did the whole thing the night before. Um, and I was just like... Um, you know, so I kind of had it all sitting in my head and I just zipped through this and it kind of, it was kind of interesting. I was kind of basically trying to say like, um, hey, you know what? AI could actually be quite a big deal, mm. which at the time people and didn't really <laughs> believe. Yeah. So this your was prediction back, was correct. Yeah. So this is like 2013 <laughs> or 14. I was kind of like, hey, you know, things are really moving fast. And so I basically just threw in as many examples as I could. So it was like this, uh, I don't know, stream of consciousness of like, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. Mm. And uh, yeah, people really talk to it. Um, so in the end, yeah, going all the way to Brussels, you know, I, I guess there's like 5,000 people in the audience. But like you said, then somehow it ended up on the homepage, of, you know, the front page of TED.com. And suddenly it had millions of people watching it. And now, yeah, I often have people like stop me in the street and be like, hey, you're the guy from that TED video, mm. right? <laughs> And the talk was brilliant. Like uh, I really remember that. So Thanks. I have so many, many of the talks. So, and I really remember some parts of yours. So, oh great. And, uh, I have one more uh, topic to discuss, and it's uh, like how we can use AI for uh, somehow helping the issue of climate change. Is is there any 
anything that uh, or any idea that uh, is in your I'm mind. Not the, yeah, I'm not the right person to ask about that. Um, there is a conference workshop on that exact topic. I seem to remember. I think it might have been Yoshua Bengio, who was one of the um, Turing Award winners, I think. So uh, I know there are people thinking about this, but I'm not going to comment on stuff I don't have expertise about other, other than to say I know it's uh, an area of interest and some people seem to think it, okay, so the, there are opportunities. There I mean, I'm, I mean, look, given how badly most of the world handled an immediate exponentially growing threat that was like two or three weeks away from killing tens of thousands of people. It makes me feel pretty bad about a right. decades long threat <laughs> uh, that you actually have to deal with decades before it happens. So I got to say, I'm feeling a bit skeptical now, but yeah. So, uh uh, but f for me, st still, there is a lesson that we learned from this uh, coronavirus that we can use even for those other big challenges. So maybe the future will be some movement yeah. for climate change. Yeah. Or, I, I mean, the other thing that's difficult is what, what, I don't know what are the what are the what like one of the great things you showed with masks is that it's something that it, it's a super high value public health initiative that a grassroots community response can do on its own. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder what the equivalents exactly, are for climate exactly, change, exactly, you know, yeah. what, how do you deal with like the almond and rice industries in California or, you know, aluminum smelting energy or whatever. It's like, it feels, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the community responses to climate change kind of make people feel good, but, but yeah, don't really do much. Mm -hmm. And kind of people brand it a lot. Like one of the classic ones I've seen, I don't know if you have these in Europe, but in California, the bottles of water where the bottle cap is like half as high as usual. And there's all this branding on the bottle saying like, this is our great climate change initiative is to have a smaller bottle cap. I'm just thinking like the very, you know, like <laughs> bottled water is the problem. <laughs> Changing the size of the bottle cap is just, Mm -hmm. a stupid branding initiative um so like i, I do I, I i love grassroots community movements like the one you created which actually make a difference but mm -hmm. grassroots community movements that basically distract people from the reality mm -hmm. of like companies right. destroying yeah. the environment drive me crazy so and let me discuss the last part and i'm always asking my guests about their personal values so uh what are your main values uh, in your life? I don't know. I guess um, a lot of it comes down to empathy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, so much of the problems in the world happen when we assume that people that don't look like us or talk like us are not worth listening to or thinking about. Um, so I think like travel is great. You know, listening to a right. range of voices is great. Um, and, you know, kind of taking responsibility. Like, it's easy for data scientists and academics to think they're so far removed from the actual products that end up getting shipped or whatever. But we always try to say to people, like, take responsibility for the outcomes of things that you build and work that you do. Try to make sure your work means something. Um you know, and I guess in the end, like, yeah, tr try to make a positive impact on the world. And, and um, like for me, one of my values is to try to do things in a high leverage way. Mm -hmm. So I would much rather, um, even though it kind of feels better to do something where I can directly see the person I'm affecting, I instead try to do things where, you know, it can make a statewide or countrywide or global difference in a high leverage way, even if I don't necessarily see the people that I'm helping. Right. So th that that's the thing that we have in common. I, re I, I really have the, the same. That's why I moved from Czech Republic to the US because mm. uh, I thought that uh, I can have like a higher or bigger impact, the, the bigger scale of the impact because yes. uh, I really believe that uh, 
the world has many, many challenges, not just the climate change, not just fake news, but many others. And we will be able to face those challenges with people with values. So those brilliant, uh, brilliant minds everywhere, uh, we need to like team up and cooperate to tackle those those challenges. So that's why we have this talk and that's why we started the Mass for All movement, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's mm. great. And it's great that I'm now, you know, in touch with inspiring people like you, you know, great, great community leaders. Um, it's it's one of the great, you know, pleasures to have come out of this uh, awful situation. Right, yeah. So thank you so much for everything. And thank uh, you. I hope that once we will meet in person, wherever, I think maybe in Australia, maybe in the US, maybe in Europe, who knows. But, At uh, a distance of you. six feet with masks on, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and hopefully without the mask, right? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Thanks, Jeremy. Peter. And All right, mate. Uh, see you soon. Take care. All right. And, uh, bye bye. Say greetings to your uh, wife. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>